friends. My title today is Why Sit We Here Till We Die? And our text will be from 2 Kings, the seventh chapter. If you have your Bible or smartphone, I'll put the notes in. Our, we have a great a, a church app that's available for free. The app store, we also put our notes into um, other, other medias. 2 Kings chapter 7, why sit we here until we die? Elijah said, hear the word of the Lord. So Elijah is an Old Testament prophet, really elevated, given a stature to be kind of the greatest of the prophets, at least till John the Baptist. And so he had a prophetic word about a very difficult circumstance. Now, the city of Samaria had been in a prolonged, intense famine, not caused by a a drought of rain or a lack of harvest caused by the Syrian army surrounding the city and cutting off their chain supply, their food supply. So they're literally dying of starvation because of the manipulation, the control, the threat of the Syrians. And it's, and it's getting very tough. It's getting really, really tough. And the prophet said, I got a word from God. Mm. Everything can change with just one word from God. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a shea of flour will be sold for a shekel and two shays of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So both, both grain and flour and barley were not available at all. They, they were not just scarce. They were absent. And he prophesied it would be like the stores not having bread. And he said, tomorrow you go to the grocery store, bread will be cheaper than it's ever been because it will be so plenteous. So he said, the famine's over. The Message Bible says, God says, listen, the famine's over. Just look at your neighbor and say, the famine's over. Just tell them that. But the story goes on. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned... Uh, He's leaning on the wrong man. I answered the man of God and said, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And Elijah said back to him, well, here's what's going to happen. In fact, you'll see it happen with your eyes, but you won't eat of it yourself. You'll watch it happen, but not experience it. You'll watch God do it. But, so this, this wasn't just a, a question of process or a question of rational in a cognitive, you know, a deliverance, he's, he says he's mocking the prophet. So it's ridicule, scorn, mockery. It is a hor horrific resistance to the word of God. So you have to be careful when you pick a fight with God, no matter who you are. It's so good seeing Sister Ruth here, by the way. Sister Ruth, we're so glad. <laughs> Wonderful seeing you. We love you. It's good to see you back doing good. So next verse goes on and adds another dimension. The story's rich with these layers of dimensions. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate to the city. And they said to each other, why are we sitting here till we die? Why sit we here till we die? And then they, they, they worked it out. And they said, well, if we enter the city, the famines in the city will die in there. If we sit here by do nothing, we'll die. Therefore, let us come and surrender to the Syrian. And so they said, if they keep us alive, we'll live. If they kill us, we'll only die. So their, their options weren't that great, but they did something. You know what God can bless? Something. You know what God can't bless? Nothing. So they went from doing nothing to doing something. And they got up. And so it gets, the story gets better. And they rose at twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they came to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, everybody shout surprise. surprise. No one was there. Behind the smoke and mirrors, the exaggerated deception of fear is nothing. The devil's a liar. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots, the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. Then they said to each other, ah, hey, look, the king of Israel is hired against us, the king of the Hittites, the king of the Egyptians, to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight, left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, their donkeys, 
They fled for their lives. They were so afraid, they didn't even grab their possessions. They, they just hightailed it out of there. So, you know, God snaps his fingers. They, they heard these sounds. And the four lepers men came to the outskirts of the camp. And so they're, they're, they're walking in the camp. They went into one tent. And there's nothing there but food and provision, clothing and wealth. And so they ate and drank. And they carried from the tent silver and gold and clothing and went out and hid these things. They came back and entered another tent and carried out from that tent the wealth also. They went and did it. So they're going from tent to tent. They're eating as much as they needed to. And then they're accumulating now wealth. And they're looking for places to bury it. So at some point, after a few tents, their conscience kicked in. And they looked at each other and said, we're not doing the right thing. This is a day of good news. Everybody say good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. Christians must not be silent about telling the world the good news of the saving work and grace of Jesus Christ. It is our high calling. And so they, they said, it's not good what we're doing. If we wait till the morning light, we might be punished. Therefore, let us go and tell the king's household. So they went and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, say, we went to the enemy's camp, took back what he stole from us. You've got to be an old Pentecostal. Took back what he stole from us. Took, okay, you don't know it. And so they went there and they're telling the story. The king's reluctant. He said, it might be a trap. Have you ever tried to someone, help someone, they have so much unbelief, it takes like five miracles and a kick in the rump to get them into, the, God's doing this. And so the king finally sent out some soldiers to go look at it, and it was true. It all was true. The enemy had been defeated. It's amazing what God can do in 24 hours. Someone here is just 24 hours away from a breakthrough, a miracle, a, an answer. Something that's been so hard is going to be turned into such a great miracle. And so this story is just so rich. And so all these things happen and there's, they've investigated it all. And verse uh, uh, 30, uh, uh, 20, 16, excuse me. Then the people went out and plundered the tents of the Syrians. So just like the prophet said, a shea of flour was sold for a shekel, two shays of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Now the king had appointed an officer in whose hand he leaned, the same guy who mocked Elijah in the first part of the chapter, the king gave authority to control who gets out and who doesn't. He put this guy as a gatekeeper. But the people trampled him in the gate. So he's playing his game. So it'd be like a bouncer at a popular you know, club. I wouldn't know, I just watched it on TV. And the, the bouncer says, you can come in, you can't. You can come in, you can't. And so he's picking his friends. He's letting them go. And he's holding back the masses. And the people all looked at each other and says, who does this guy think he is? He's a liar, a deceiver, a manipulator, a narcissist, a controller. He's evil. And they ran through the gates. The gates fell on him and he died. Now we live in an amazing time when the gatekeepers are coming down. Thank you, two of you. You're going to get it. People trampled him in the gate just like the man of God has said he died. So what happened just as the man, this story is told three times. The emphasis is on this, that, this guy, this event. It's highlighted. So what happened just as the man of God had spoken, two shays, barley for a shekel, shea of flour for a shekel, will be sold tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. Then that officer on who the king leaned said, now if the Lord would make a window in heaven, could these things be? And Elijah said, in fact, your eyes will see it, but you won't eat it. So it happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gate, and he died. Father, thank you for your word that is living, that's powerful, that's sharper than any two-edged sword. Let there be revelation in this moment, and what your servant, your word, your people, show the devil who is boss. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just a couple points. First off, the great preponderance of suffering and justice and pain in this world is the direct result of bad leadership. Now, earthquakes, um, 
tornadoes, hurricanes, those things aren't. So th these are acts of nature. These are, but when you weigh all of the destruction in the world today, by far more people are suffering because of bad leaders than any, any other causation. So the Bible says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked are, people mourn. They moan. They, they don't moan because they, they just disagree with the policies. They moan because they're suffering. Oh, there's so many things I could say about that. But it's true. It's always been true. It's true now. Point number two. When God speaks, everything changes. When God speaks, everything changes. So they're in this impossibly difficult circumstance, and it had been elevated to so much pain and so much suffering. The king is desperate. He, he's actually blaming God. He's met the prophet, but God said, okay, it's time for this whole thing to end, this fiasco to end. And Elijah said, in 24 hours, everything changes. And everything changed. Now, here's my point. God answers your prayer most of the time by giving you a word to stand on. When you stand on, pray, and speak your word, the answer comes. So give us today our daily bread. It's not just talking about a McDonald's sandwich. Uh, let, me, let me upgrade that. A Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich. A spice <laughs> and the waffle fries. Oh, oh, my God. Lord, please help Chick-fil-A to open on Sundays. Amen. <laughs> okay, just talk myself into a meal. No, God blesses them, you know, hello, bless them for that stand. So God speaks, gives us a word. So when you ask God to help you, most of the time, he help begins by God giving you a scripture or a prophetic word or in your heart, vision, dream, prophecy. God gives you something from him so that you could apply that in your world. When you apply that in your world, things change. God didn't just change things, God commanded things to change. God didn't just think, let there be light, he said, let there be light. Jesus was going to pray for a, the servant of a centurion. The centurion was a godly man, a Roman leader of a hundred soldiers, but he was well thought of, a man of moral and virtue. And so Jesus said, okay, I'll come to your house and pray for you, pray for this man. And the centurion said, you don't have to come to my house. Speak the word only. For I also am a man under authority. I say to one, go, and he goes. One, do this, and he does that. One, come here, and he comes here. And the Bible says Jesus marveled at his faith. He said, I've not seen faith like this, no, not in Israel. The man understood by his government how God's government worked. And God's government works by word. In the beginning was the word. God rules by his word. And God releases his will in your life by his word. And when every day we prophesy the future by what we say, when you add God's word to your words, you release God's will to be done. <laughs> Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life. So we want to be people agreeing with God, speaking, proclaiming, praying, praising God in alliance with the, what he wants to do. The Bible says the word of God in Hebrews 4.12 the Word of God is living and powerful. And there's no book on the planet like the Bible. The Bible is not just a collection of ancient stories from people in antiquity. The Bible lives. It's God-breathed. It's God-inspired. It is inerrant without error. It's an infallible, can't fa fail. It's inspired by God. And when you read the Bible, God speaks to you. And when God speaks to you, He wants you to speak what He said. When you say what you hear, you'll see what you say. Say it, baby. Say it. Pray it. Okay? Point number three. The real controlling power in the world today is media. Never in human history has so much influence and wealth rested in the hands of so few people. I don't know if you know this, but basically five people run the world. They, they control information. So... We've gone from the agrarian society to the industrial age to the technological age. They call this now the information age. The gatekeepers of this moment are the ones that control the information. So it's Google, it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. 
So those, those four groups and a, you know, a couple more, YouTube, they control the vast preponderance of what people get to see. They control what you see and what you don't see. And so it's never, and the wealth that they've accumulated, we've never seen anything like this. So this is an amazing time, it's an exciting time. The media and tech gatekeepers are almost all completely single-minded in their anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-Bible beliefs and practices. Just, just watch, you know, I don't watch the news, I stopped watching news years ago. Why would I watch liars? The only thing I watch occasionally is the weather. They even lie about that. No, that's just, it's, it's, it's like God having fun with the weatherman. Oh, it's not going to rain today. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, God's just messing with the weatherman. They go home crying. I thought, it, what's going on? So we've never seen anything like this. Today's politicians and cultural and business leaders all lean on the media for their direction and decisions. They put their finger up, which way is the wind blowing? These immoral, godless leaders believe in nothing, stand for nothing, and accept what the media tells them to do. This generation, though, is breaking free from the control and deception of ungodly media. I had a national media outlet call me, three numbers. Um, I think they were the original fake news, but they, they called me a couple of lectures. Second, they called my office 10 times. We really want to. <laughs> Pastor, don't, why would I talk to them? There's nothing that they won't manipulate to make what we believe look bad. You know, there, they will distort everything. They have an agenda. They're not giving me facts. They're giving me opinions. They have a strong point of view. It's contrary to kingdom thinking. So why would I give them an ounce of my time? Now, I wasn't rude to them. I just said, no, I'm too busy praying, seeking God, and winning souls. Yeah. Shandai Mandai. That's just, there's, that's, okay, let me go. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Why? How? Put on the whole armor of God, put on God's weapons, that you'll be able to stand against the wiles, the trickery of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, the spiritual darkness in heavenly places, the rulers of darkness of this world. Therefore, take up the armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, having done or overcome all stand. Now, now listen, the devil is at war with your mind. Media is his number one tool. Now we're seeing things happen we've never seen happen. My generation, so let me just go a little deeper. My generation, 2% of people identify as being non-heterosexual. So some other gender than heterosexual. The, the newest poll said Generation Z, teenagers, are saying that they're identifying as non-heterosexual at 20 plus percent. So that's a 10 time increase in a 40 year period. We call that a social contagion. Now you better get this because there are evangelists and media trying to pull your, ki your kids, your grandkids into sexual deviation, sexual deception, trying to steal their identity and make them someone they were never meant to be. If you even speak out against that, they'll counsel you. They'll call you transphobic, homophobic. They'll call, they'll call you names. And, and you have to be able to withstand the name calling to stand in the truth. We love everybody. I love every deceived person. I love every media person. But I'm fighting for my kids and my grandkids. And I'm not going to let my voice be silent. So what's happening, your kids through so social media is damaging children. Well, it's just innocent. You think it is? It's not. It is creating undue influence, 
controlling persuasive influence on little minds, vulnerable minds. So some, someone said, Pastor, how can I help my child that's caught up in this? I would do two things. I'd immediately take them out of school and I'd cut off all their social media. And I'd love them and I'd minister to them. I'd get them in godly therapy. My God, don't send them to an ungodly therapist. They'll just tell them how bad the church is and how, how good it is to transition into the world of confusion and suffering. Upside, the, the Bible says the time will come when they say evil is good and good is evil. We're there. We're there. We're there right now and people, serious medical people, serious government people saying that we should allow 12 years old to chemically and surgically transition out of their sex. Man, how many of you at 12 years old were a little messed up? And, you know, lots of girls here were tomboys at 12. And, but this generation says, let, let's, let's, let's permanently mark them. There, there used to be a process you had to be in your mid-20s and go through 10 years of intense therapy for that. Now there's thing. Do it. Doesn't matter what your parents say. It's getting intense because our kings have been listening to the wrong voices. Our kings have been listening to the wrong voices. And of course, there's a whole bunch of areas. I'm sorry to be stuck in that one. I'm kind of, you know, my beautiful grandchildren matter to me. Second Corinthians. 10 says this, though we walk in the flesh, we don't war in the flesh. So we're in full-blown spiritual warfare. And the spiritual warfare, Pastor, where's the battleground? Your mind. What's the weapons? Thoughts. What's the enemy's main thought? Thrower. Media. Media. So interesting. We've got to discern this. We have to handle this right. Well, Pastor, uh, you know, are, are you against everything? No, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying you have to control. If you have kids, you have to watch their influences. You have to watch who's speaking into their world. And you have to be brave enough as a parent to pull them out of environments that are hurting them. And no, no matter what, no matter how much they hate you or are mad at you or whatever, it's better to save their souls and have them mad at you for two years than have them ruined by a culture that says they love them. I'm sorry, but a, a doctor that would mutilate a, a 12-year-old, 13, 14-year-old child doesn't love that child. They love the money, the $50,000 they get from the surgery. Okay, how do I get it? I've completely ruined my sermon. The king was leaning on the wrong person. It's amazing how strategic, we, we found out in this season, so if we evaluate the last three years, just look at it kind of in a forensic, what, so we can actually see who the really, the, the power players are. It's, it's the media. They're out in the open now, out in the open. An event happened this week and I, I was looking it up and so I, I got some facts, did a little tiny bit of research, got some facts on it, turned on the news, I did three, three channels. Each channel lied about the facts I knew. I said, what is wrong with you people? You think we're all stupid? And they wonder why viewership's going down. They wonder why 16% of people trust media. They're not trusted. They're dishonest. They have an agenda. Their agenda's obvious. And it's time to take the gates back. <laughs> what do we do, Pastor? Well, first of all, vote. I don't want to hear one Christian complain how bad things are if they're still not voting. Well, the whole system is broken. Yeah, because you won't vote. Vote kingdom. Vote biblical. Vote your values. Pray about who to vote for. God will help you. He really will. It's becoming more and more clear, you know, this, this person stands for these things and this person stands for other things. You can look and it's what they, it's not the personality that matters. It's their programs. It's their platforms. It's their issues. That's what matters. This week, the fever on America finally broke by a eccentric billionaire who bought Twitter. So maybe you're like, well, I don't like, you know, what's he going to do? Well, he can't do any worse. 
I have at least 50 friends who were kicked off t- Twitter for preaching the gospel, for quoting scripture, for telling the truth, for questioning the status quo, for, for, for non-aggressive, just facts. I mean, there was a war against Christians and conservative values, obviously. And he's, he, he says, I'm just going to make it more honest. If you're for canceling people, you're not in the kingdom. You're not thinking kingdom. If you think canceling people is somehow appropriate, man, you're on the devil's side. The devil destroys people. I've been canceled. I know what it feels like. It's not pleasant. It's not fun. And if you are on that side, you're on the dark side of the force. Luke, don't go to the dark side. The kingdom of God restores, forgives, blesses, loves. We walk in repentance, renewal. We don't give up on people. We don't throw people to hell. We don't cast them out of darkness. Although I did block someone this week. Lord, forgive me. I felt like when I blocked, I didn't say anything. I'm casting you out of darkness. I shouldn't have took any pleasure. I did. I'm sorry, Lord. So this guy, this billionaire, bought Twitter, and he's not a Christian yet. He's, you know, he's, he's kind of, I, I would say, libertarian in his doctrines, and, you know, I've seen him do some good things. You know, he's got a messy personal life, whatever. But, but he saw this isn't right. So God used a non-Christian because there wasn't a Christian available. And now we're storming the gates. Just watch what happens. Watch, I've got, you know, most of my age primarily on Facebook. I'm, you know, on Instagram because I'm hipper than you. (laughs) Just kidding. I'm on everything to try to spread. I, I, I talk about Jesus, my grandkids, and sunsets. And also some funny stuff. That's it for me. And we're at a, I don't think people understand how important this week was. Change has begun. Change has begun. We should be allowed to preach the gospel and disagree with people. See, see, the culture says if you don't agree with them, you hate them. That's, That's a lie. I love you, you're crazy. Okay? God loves crazy people. I'm proof. I love you. I'm sorry. I don't. The Bible tells me what truth is. What you're doing is not truth. I love you. To disagree with someone doesn't mean you hate them. Often it means you love them enough to challenge a deception they're living in. It's just going to get more and more exciting. Either the Bible is true or it's not. You have to make the, I've made my decision. I'm living my life by the word of God. Okay, I actually have a good point. Here it is, number four. (laughs) Here's my positive. I'm closing with a positive. Why sit we here till we die? The, The four lepers outside the gate, think about this. They're suffering the same plight as the people inside the city, even though they've been rejected, disowned, unloved by the city because of their leprous condition. And so it's amazing that they have a duality of suffering. They were canceled before cancel culture was popular. And they, you know, for some just cause. Many Bible scholars believe that these four lepers were Gehazi and his three sons. They became lepers because of greed. So in chapter 5, Elijah comes to pray for Naaman, the Syrian general with leprosy, and he heals him. And Naaman brought a king's ransom to give to Elijah. And Elijah said, no, no money. Just just take your healing and go home and be happy. Well, Gehazi is upset, so he runs without Elijah's permission and and finds Naaman and stops him and says, hey, Elijah changed his mind. Go ahead and give us some stuff. So he took not all of it, but a few wealthy possessions, some gold or whatever, silver, whatever it was. 
So God gave Elijah, of course, a word of knowledge what had happened. So he comes back home and he says, where were you? I went with you. I saw what you did. You'll be a leper. So he became a leper because of greed. Greed makes you ugly. Greed makes you repellent to the kingdom. Why? Because God is so, not just generous, overly generous. So greed, their greed made them sick. So they're punished. And it was a generational curse. Him, his, every male heir has been a leper. So in this remarkable story, for unclean, unwanted, unloved, and publicly ridiculed and judged individuals become the heroes of their generation with just one act of bravery. These four men were cursed by a great sin, but they broke the curse by a great act of faith. I don't care how bad you failed. I don't care how much shame you've carried. I don't care how many mistakes you've made. God can still use you to save a generation, to help your family, to help a city, to change the world. You've literally got nothing to lose by putting your faith in God. It doesn't matter how big or how many mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter how bad your past may be. It doesn't matter what everyone else thinks about you, feels about you, or speaks about you. It's not too late for you. You've got nothing to lose by getting back up. You've got nothing to lose by trusting God. You've got nothing to lose by standing to your feet and refusing to sit out the rest of your life in pain and shame. My friend, it's time to get up and move forward in your life. God's not done in your story. I'm sorry, sometimes it's other people's fault we're down. Sometimes it's our fault we're down. But God never asked one sick, Jesus didn't ask one sick person that came to him how they got sick. He healed them all. He lifted them all up. It doesn't matter how you got there, God can help you get back up. The best chapters of your life are yet to come. God, I don't care who calls you a leper, be God's leper. I don't care who shamed you, God will give you favor. I don't care how bad your past is, God's going to make your future better in good ways than bad ways in your past. Give God the chance to write a good ending to your story. Give God the chance to use you. Don't let shame and condemnation and ridicule keep you down and bound. Don't live the rest of your life feeling sorry for you. I felt so sorry for myself. I wrote a country western album. <laughs> it's the truth. The songs ain't bad. God says, how long are you going to be that way? Why don't you get up? Isaiah says like, like this, arise and shine. Your light has come. It's time to get back up. I'm sorry your marriage went wrong. I'm sorry your family disowned you. I'm sorry something horrible happened in your childhood. I'm sorry that you made a mistake that's caused you great pain. I'm sorry for all those things, but my friend, God doesn't throw people away. God doesn't give up on people. Well, Pastor, I've been bankrupt. I've been, so, so what? So if I, I used to preach against bankruptcy until I had one. I'm like, I think we should be more merciful to people facing bankruptcy. You with me? Before that, you should never file for bankruptcy. You always believe God. Years later, I'm bankrupt. Forced into it by life. Okay, but I'm, I want to do this. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm getting back up. Turn to the other neighbor and say, I'm getting back up. <clears throat> Turn to the person behind you and say, I'm getting back up. Turn to the person in front of you and say, I'm getting back up. I'm going to count to three. When I count to three, I just want you to say those words. Maybe if, you're, if you want to shout them, you don't have to, but I want you to say, I'm getting back up. And then I want you to stand to your feet because just a simple little prophetic act we're telling the devil our story's not over. Listen, you're about to plunder the enemy. Yeah. 
I walked in those doors 13 years ago when Charles and Mary Combs turned this campus over to us, a miracle. I'd never been here. I walked in those doors and God gave us this remarkable facility, this campus for free. Now here's the point. The only thing that got me here, the main thing that got me here was I got back up. And I lived long enough for God to do that. There's a day circled on your calendar when something's going to happen that God can't wait for you to have. You just got to get back up. Get back up. You're going to say, I'm getting back up on the count of three. I'm getting back up on the count of three. One, devil, your power is over. Two, pain is leaving this room. Three, it's miracle day. I'm getting back up. Stand on your feet and say, come on. Come on. I'm getting back up. Come on, someone give God a shout of praise in this church. Just a couple things. When people speak against you, it happens to me all the time. I never curse them back. I, the last three years I've been called names that I've never been called. That I don't deserve to be called. I never retaliated in, in kind, in the same fashion. I forgave them. But I rebuked the devil. Here's what Isaiah said, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Every word spoken against you, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the saints of the Lord. Their righteousness is of me. So I break words all the time. I, I speak blessings, but I, I bless the people, but I break their curses. You with me? Come on, I helped lead a, a witch to Christ a couple weeks ago. I, I've led people to Christ that in services were trying to throw witchcraft on me. It, it doesn't work. I've got a a vest on called the armor of God. I, it doesn't, doesn't work. I never get mad at them. You kidding me? They're so aggressive, man. I want to get on our, our side. Man, you'd be great in our side. Playing for the losing team. What's going on, man? Prayer team, join me down front. I need to wrap up this service. As we close today, thank you for listening to me in this sermon that turned out different than I thought it would. Prayer team, join me down front. We're going to pray for those that need prayer. The greatest victory in life and the most important moment of your life is when you receive Christ Jesus as your Savior and Lord. If you've never received the free gift of the forgiveness of your sins and the eternal life that God gives as a consequence, we'd be so honored. The Bible says in the book of Romans, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We'd be so honored to pray for you. I, I forgot the story when Mary told me to tell it. Matthew, it was London's homecoming and Isabella's homecoming to their high school. <clears throat> and so there was a, an outdoor slide there, real high. So London, or excuse me, Dakota looked at her daddy and said, because Matthew conquered his fear of heights and uh, is conquering his fear of heights in Jesus' name. All of our all maiden men are. And she said, Daddy, I'm facing my fear. I'm going to fight my fear today. What, what, I'm facing my fears today. If my four-year-old granddaughter can do it, you can do it. My four <clears throat> Man, if you've never received Christ, today's your day. We're so honored to pray with you. If you've been away from God in, in a broken fellowship, man, God's ready for you. It'd be our deep honor to pray for you. If you need a healing in your mind or your body, we'd be honored to pray for you. Maybe you're just going through a very difficult moment. You need someone to speak the prayer of faith. We'd be honored to pray for you. Anyone wanting prayer, if you join us just for 60 seconds longer, worship God with me. Rains came, wind blew my
Jesus loves you like crazy. Tell someone Jesus loves you like crazy. God bless you.